Favourite scripture, I've got lots of favourites, but <laughs> in, in situations where I need it, it's my favourite. I am the redeemed of the Lord and I say so. But he has redeemed me from the hand of the enemy. So he's redeemed me from sickness and disease. He's redeemed us from poverty. He's redeemed us from anxiety. He's redeemed us from loneliness. He's redeemed us. Whatever it is we face, he has paid the price and he has redeemed us. We are the most blessed of people. Most blessed of people. Sometimes I wish my face showed that a bit more, but we'll get there. <laughs> Sorry, Father, I forgot to smile. <laughs> Sorry, Father, I gave that person my task face. <laughs> Ephesians. Okay, we're up to chapter two, finally. Just a quick overview. Father, as we come before you, we recognise that Yeshua, he is the living word of God. That every time we open your word, it's a portal into the spiritual realm. For he is the living word. And we receive the living word. Now I speak right now, and I call our spirits to the top of our being to be in submission to Holy Spirit. I command our souls to be in submission to our spirit and our flesh, our bodies, to be in submission to our souls. That we would receive your word through our spirits and that our spirit would communicate it to our soul. And then it would be outworked through our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. So we looked at Ephesians being, um, oh gosh, I love the word. <laughs> Other people love music. I open the word and I'm already there, you know what I mean? So Ephesians uh, 1, 2 and 3 is about our wealth in Christ. Chapter 4 and 5 is about our walk. Chapter 6 is about our warfare. And we don't go into war till we know our wealth, till our walk is what it should be. It's not ever going to be perfect, but aligned. And then we can go to war knowing that the victory is certainly ours. And when we do that, you're protected against counterattack and backlash and all that kind of stuff. So it's important that we know our wealth, who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ. <clears throat> and then our walk is appropriate. So in chapter 1, from verses 1 to 14, we are like, it's Paul is talking out of the spirit into our spirits, right? You can't receive this in the soul. You can't receive this in the mind because it just becomes knowledge. You think, oh, yeah, that's really nice. But when it hits your spirit, man, it becomes alive. He says to the saints, you know, you are a saint, to the faithful, you're blessed, you're chosen, you're accepted, you're adopted. I mean, all of these things about your new creation reality, this is who you really are. Who you were is not who you are now. Like there's just been, that's dead and buried and now you're alive in Christ and he's saying this is who you are favored blessed forgiven redeemed uh, all of these amazing things chosen before the foundation of the world holy blameless in love you've been adopted as a son you, then this is God's good pleasure he said God loved to do this like you are his pleasure you're his delight you know and it goes and then it says in verse 6 to the praise of of the glory of his grace. So he calls us all of these things. This is who you are as a new creation to the praise of the glory of his grace. And then from verse 7 it says, redeemed, forgiven. And this is all according to the riches of his grace, which already abounds to us in all wisdom and prudence and understanding. He says, I want you to know the mystery of his goodwill. I want you to know his pleasure, his good pleasure. There's an inheritance. You've been predestined to a purpose that God has commissioned you for since before the foundation of the world. You're there there is, um, and in verse 14, it says, this is to the praise of his glory. So something just a little bit different, but it's all about that. And then verses 15 to 22, you want to grow in the things of God, you pray this prayer. Verses 15 to 22, he says, I want you to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I want the eyes of your heart to be opened. I want you to see things. I want you to... Um, 
to know three things. I want you to know the hope of your calling. I want you to know the riches of the glory of his, of his, the glory of his inheritance. And thirdly, which we should really know, I want you to know the exceeding greatness of his power towards us as believers. That power resides on the inside of us. That power that creates, think about this, like, man, you've got more power on the inside of you than an atomic bomb, <laughs> right? Because the power that created the universe resides on the inside of you, Amen. right? Everything Amen. is possible. Amen. All things are possible. Doesn't matter what it is, that power is in you. He says, I want you to know, understand the power of Gosh, God is so extravagant in his generosity and his goodness. And the way he just says, man, I love you so much. What do you want? He can have that and more. You know, and look, when he created Adam, they said, we're going to create Adam. And then he formed him. So there's a difference between creation and then he formed him out of the dust of the ground. But then he blew into his mouth the breath of life. Right? And Adam became a living soul, a praying being. And when Adam opened his eyes, the first thing he saw was the face of his father. We were born for that. We were born again for that. The intimacy, like father hovering over, waiting for Adam's eyes to open, waiting for him to come to life. Father loves you so much. He loves you so, so much. He withholds nothing. Nothing. Whatever you, you know, he places his desires in our heart so that we're fulfilled. Oh, he's just the best. And you are blessed by the best. And so we've got to know this power. And the power really, do you know what it was? It's the power of love. Because he is love. It's his power. And that's love. And you can go right through the Bible and you can replace the word God with the word love. Because he is love. And love created the heavens and the earth. And love breathed into Adam the breath of life. Oh, wow. We're just the most blessed. And it finishes up in, in the end of chapter 1 with Jesus being exalted far above all principalities, all powers, any name that can be named. And he's the head of all things and the head of the church. But in chapter 2, it's all about the new, the new condition in Christ, the new relationship that we have with Christ. And this is why you've got to receive this in your spirit. It's no good taking it in as head knowledge because information does not do you any eternal good. Right? We need eternal deposits. Eternal deposits in your spirit. And the soul is kind of like a conduit. The spirit, the spirit takes it in and then it's got to go through the conduit of the soul to affect the mind, to affect the emotions, to uh, affect our speech. And then it goes out through the body to, uh, to demonstrate the kingdom of God. So the soul is the conduit, but it's what you feed it as to who wins the fight. So we feed it spiritually. So the book of Ephesians, Paul is talking spiritually and he's wanting us to receive this in our spirits. Because that's the only way that our mind gets renewed. It's from our spirit. And so he says, you've got a new condition. Oh, my gosh. And don't you love it? Because I, I love, just love the word of God. But I love, like, counting things and looking at things and stuff. And stuff. And this new condition about who we are in verses 1 to 10, there are four things that parallel who we were and who we are now. Four things that parallel. So in, and let me just read, and I didn't mean to bring this Bible, but I did. Um, I've got the Amplified. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3. And you, he made alive. He made you alive when you were dead and slain by your own trespasses and sins, which at one time you walked in habitually. You were following the course and fashion of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, you are under obedience to and under the control of demonic spirits that still constantly work in the sons of disobedience. 
in the careless, the rebellious, the unbelieving, who go against the purposes of God. Verse 3, among these we as well as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passion of our flesh, our behaviour governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind. Our cravings were dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then by nature children of wrath and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. Basically what he's saying there was an unbridled indulgence of passions that the old one walked in. And so, but he made us alive. That's the very first thing he says, and you he made alive. His fullness fills you. His fullness fills you. It's just awesome. So first up, he says, we were spiritually dead. We were separated spiritually from God. In my BC condition, my before Christ condition, I was spiritually dead, right? No connection with God whatsoever, totally separated from him. And then in verse 2, it says, I was subject to Satan, to the prince of the power of the air. Take that back to Ephesians 6.12, spirits of uh, wickedness in high places. You know, we were subject to that. We were, under the, we were in the kingdom of darkness without even knowing it. We were Satan's subjects without even being aware of it. We were so deceived, so blinded, thinking we're good people, living a good life, or caught up in whatever we were caught up in, but not realising that there was anything else. But in every one of us, there is a void. There's an emptiness that before we're born again, we're just aware that there's something like an itch that can't be scratched. Do you know what I mean? And it's only when we come to Christ that it's like, ah, oh, that's what I was looking for. All this time, down all the alleys I went down, all the different things I tried, you were what I was looking for the whole time. Wow. You were what I was looking for. But we weren't even aware of that because we were caught up in this under the blindness of the, the darkness of the age that, you know, because it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So whenever you're talking to someone who's an unbeliever, be aware that they are blind and possibly they need the light. And then it says in um, verse 3, that we uh, lived and conducted ourselves, you know, um, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind. So we live by the decrees of the flesh, which is our earthbound attitudes. It's what I wanted. I still, like every now and again, I think that I'm dead to that. But you know what? <sighs> that desire for food. <sighs> no, no, no. Or living by the decrees of the mind, which is ambition. This is what I want. This is where I want to go. This is what I want to have. These are my goals. This is it. This is what I'm doing. And I'm leaning on the thing. So he says, we're under divine condemnation. Leaning on the pulpit. I was leaning on the pulpit. Living under divine condemnation. He said, we were rebel rebellious. We were children under the sentence of wrath. God's wrath. So we're separated from him. I think that's enough judgment right there, to be separated from love, to be separated from a, a heavenly father, to be separated. I mean, if that, those three verses don't give you an evangelistic fervor yeah. to get people saved, because where would we be if we had not been saved? Yeah. If Jesus had not intercepted our, the path of our life, mm. where would we be? I don't even want to think about it. Yeah, don't want to go there. I don't want to go there at all. Yeah. But when you walk into the supermarket, or when you go to work, or when you see the kids playing on the fields, and you realise that so many of them don't know Jesus, haven't been touched by the Father's love. And if we don't start to speak up and tell the truth, Jesus loves you and start to build hope and reach out with salvation. How many are going to go to hell or be separated from the Father forever? And we look at our own family, the members that aren't yet saved or the ones that have backslidden. 
that are all the ones that, you know, go to church. Yeah, go to church. Yeah, I'm a believer. I go to church. But man, there's not a lot of fire. They go through the motions. There's not a lot of fire. We've really got to start when we look at people, recognize where they are spiritually. Holy Spirit, I think Paul says in one of his books, Paul wrote so much, but he said um, that we need to know each other by the Spirit. By the Spirit. Not by the soul. Not by what they look like, what their name is, how much money they've got in the bank. Not anything, but, but by the Spirit and the Father's love for them. So we need to have an evangelistic fervor in these, in these times. We need to really care about where people are headed. But then in verse 4, after telling us where we were and how hard it was and how horrible we were and we were all under wrath and everything, he says, but God. I think that's my favourite verse in the whole world. But God. But God. So rich in mercy and love. But God. So compassionate. But God, who is such a comforter. But God, who is such a rescuer. But God, who's such a champion. But God, who's our hero. But God steps in. He steps in. So rich is he in his mercy in order to satisfy the great and the wonderful intense love with which he loved us. He stepped in because of his love. And uh, he says that, um, so let me just read verses 4 to 10. But God, so rich is he in his mercy because of the great and the wonderful and the intense love with which he loved you, even when you were dead by your own shortcomings and trespasses, he made you alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave you the very life of Christ himself. You've been given the very life of Christ. You've been given his life. Yes. Right? Yes. His life. You've been given his life, not yours. His life. The same new life with which God quickened Christ, for it is by grace that you are saved. And he raised you up together with him and made you sit down together, giving you joint seating with Christ in the heavenly sphere, in Christ Jesus the Messiah. And he did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favour, his kindness and goodness of heart towards you in Christ Jesus. For it is by free grace, by God's unmerited favour, that you are saved and delivered from judgment and made a partaker of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourself. It's not of your own doing. It doesn't come through your own striving it is the sheer gift of God glory to God it is a gift and we need to take that gift and unwrap it each and every day and look at it from a fresh perspective you know like like God delights in giving gifts and this gift of salvation is not because of eternity and forever it is but it's for life Jesus said I've come to teach you how to live I'm going to fill you with myself and I'm going to live through you and so he's, we've got this gift of salvation which includes health, healing wholeness, safety, soundness well-being, rescue, everything he's given us this gift and you know we get up in the morning and it's sort of like praise God, you know thank you Jesus yeah I dedicate the day to you <gasps> <laughs> but he's given you this amazing gift. So what would it be like if, like, remember Elizabeth and the gift of favour? Every morning she would sit down and she would take the gift of favour and we would take whatever gift it is, redemption, salvation, whatever, and she would sit down every morning and say, Father, thank you for this gift. You have wrapped it so beautifully. This is gorgeous. Thank you, Father. Then she would see herself unwrapping the bow and, and opening up the paper and, and just, you know, like unwrapping this beautiful gift. And then she would admire it. Oh, Father, look what you've given me. Look what you've given me. Oh, thank you. doesn't matter which way I look at it. It's just exquisite. And it's just for me. It's just gorgeous. And she took the time every single day to unwrap this same gift. And if we did that with salvation, thank you, Father.
Today you rescue me from everything that's, oh man, God, look at, I rescued, but look at this, you've given me safety, soundness. Oh my gosh, there's this, oh, well-being. Oh gosh, well-being. Thank you. Health. All of these amazing things. What would it be if like every morning you unwrapped a gift from the Father? Because he doesn't wait for Christmas. In fact, I'm not sure he's involved in Christmas. <laughs> but he gives you these gifts, right? These amazing, beautiful gifts. And a lot of the times we take them for granted. We just walk it out expecting. Sometimes that's presumption. Sometimes it's assumption. But when it's faith, oh my gosh, when it's faith, thank you, Father. Thank you, Daddy. You're so good to me. You take such good care of me. I often say, thank you, Abba. Daddy God, you take such good care of me. Particularly when I'm in like situations I don't want to be in overseas. <laughs> and Danny and I often say to each other, we are just simply so blessed. We are so blessed. But acknowledge it. He's given you these beautiful gifts. Every day is a gift. This is the day the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. And the very next verse says, God, thank you for saving me today. And thank you for sending me prosperity and good success. Oh, but open the gifts. Don't just, thank you. Take the time to savour them, to unwrap them, look at them. Because every day there's a different aspect. Every day there's something he wants to show you that's a little bit different. And so we've got the most amazing. He's just so good to us. So we have a brand new condition. Where he says, but God, God loves you so much. And is so rich in his mercy. And because he loves you and he wants to enjoy you, he's going to do a work in you. It's to satisfy God's heart. Like, isn't that amazing? You satisfy the heart of the Father. You satisfy him. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to do anything. You are his child. And he just loves you. Even when we're squirming and kicking or having a hissy fit or spitting the dummy, <laughs> he just loves you. You're his. You're his. He loves you. He loves you. So the very first thing that he says in verse 5, the four Four things that we get out of this is, number one, you have been made alive together with Christ. So any aspect of your life that you feel is depressed, down, not what it should be, what's the word for it? Diminished, diluted, they're all D words, but then there's delight and all that. But whatever it is, if you, whatever it is, he says you've been made alive together with Christ by his grace, by his power. Only God would do that because of love and only God could do that. And he said, but, you know, you've been made alive, spiritually alive. You are a partaker of his divine nature. You are alive together with Christ. So whatever area of your life is not what is not Christ-like, in its fullness, you speak to it and you say, you received the life of Christ. Jesus gave me everything, so I release the life of Christ into my finances. I release the life of Christ into my soul. I release the life of Christ into pain or hurt or trauma. I release the life of Christ into unemployment. I release the life of Christ into those areas that should be reflecting the life of Christ but aren't. Oh my gosh, isn't he the best? You have been made alive with Christ. So when you get a doctor's report, what a lie. 
The symptoms might be there, but you've been made alive with Christ. And if the life of Christ is living on the inside of me, there is no room for sickness or disease. It might try to come. It might try to be established. It might try to have a go. It might try to say, you've got this symptom. You might, you know, look at this, look at that. But the thing is, I've been made alive with Christ. I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you think there's room for sickness, disease, pain or infirmity in my body, you're wrong because my Christ is an all-consuming filling on the inside of me. I am filled with his life. And in his life, there's no room for anything else. I am spiritually alive. I've been made alive together with him. His life fills me. This is the truth. This is what you've got to get. So that it just becomes, it flows out of you. Oh, my gosh. No, doctor, you're wrong. We need to take this test again. There's a fault in the equipment. I'll reschedule for next week. I'll go home. We go back and take the test. Cool. This is the time the reality of his word has got to manifest in our lives. That's what Jesus died for. That the reality of his life would manifest in and through us that we would reflect his life. And then it says in verse 6, and he's raised us up together with him, raised us up, past tense, and we are seated with him uh, in the heavenly sphere by being in Christ Jesus. We're raised up together. I love that. I am co-raised, as it says in the mirror translation. I am co-raised, co-seated with him in Christ. God raised me up with Christ and he sat me down. And when you're seated down in heaven, that means you're seated in a place of authority. You're seated at the right hand, which is a place of authority, which is the function of authority. Wow. Oh. You're seated there. You're seated there. Oh, my gosh. And he said, so think about this. What was Jesus raised from? He was raised from the grave, from death. So what, was we, what were we raised from? Death. Spiritual death. We were raised from that. We were raised up with him. We've been resurrected out of that. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, what people saw, and people saw it, remember? What they saw was victory over the enemy. Oh my gosh, look at that, he's walked. And then all of the other guys that were in the graves as well are walking around Jerusalem as well. Like, this is freaky. You died like so many years ago. Now, you know, look, it was, can you imagine what, what was going on in people's heads? Because Jesus, who had been died, who had been died, who had died and was <laughs> buried. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's out of the grave and then all sorts of stuff happened. And how many others, was it 500 or something? walking around that it also died like freaky like who let the zombies out <laughs> you know like it's so like get your head there go back there and you think now we saw him on the cross he was crucified like he was really dead i oh, know he was buried but <laughs> he was, no, but he was really dead you know what i mean really and then you're walking around and oh my gosh there's jesus Oh, and there's Uncle Fred. Oh. I mean, but think about it. Like, put yourself in the place, honestly. Wouldn't it be freaky? Wouldn't it be strange? If it's not freaky, it would be very strange. All of these dead people up out of the grave, walking around. Okay. I hope he didn't ask what happened to the thing he left me in the will. <laughs> So we've got all of this kind of thing happening. And so what they saw was the power of Christ over Satan. Right? But that also means as we've been raised up, when people look at us in the spirit realm, what they see is the victory of Christ in us over Satan. Because we have been resurrected as well. We also have visibly come forth. We should be way different. We should is such a religious word. But there, there needs, there's another religious word. <laughs> who I was in the past is market, markedly different to who I am now. Yes. Or at least that's the way it, it's meant to be. So I have visibly come forth from spiritual death. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit, I've been freed from all bondage. Come on. 
right? I've been raised with Christ far above all principalities and powers, far above, above the snake line. Sometimes the only reason you get attacked is because we've been dilly-dallying around in the second heaven, which is not far above, which is actually in the place of. But he's under our feet and we are a visible display Oh my gosh, let me, God, let me live well. We are a visible display of the riches of God's limitless grace. And then on top of that, not just saved, not just raised, but ascended and seated on the throne. Well, given all that authority, as he gives us that authority, are seated with him in heavenly places. In Christ, at the right hand. Yes, mm -hmm. The function of the right hand yeah. is the doing and the authority. Mm. You weren't just saved. You were given a brand new life. Brand new life. Christ's life. Mm. Yeah. Christ's yeah. life. That's whose life you were given. Because I was crucified. Every now and again, you know, I'm back. The old Suzette, like, I'm back. No, you're dead. Get back in the grave. That wasn't the part that was resurrected. Get back. But recognise who you are. Recognise who you are. Whoops. There goes the oil. So you're seated in the heavenlies and notice that that is present tense. Well, it's past tense because you have been raised. So spiritually, we are bilocational people. Physically, I'm here. Spiritually, I'm there. How cool is that? I've always wanted to do one of those paradigm shift kind of TV shows. But, you know, we're here, but I'm there. So where should I be living from, here or there? There. Looking down into life, looking down, seeing as Christ sees, only doing what he wants me to do. So living in the heavenlies, you know, and that's where living by the spirit is so important. And that's part of the maturing is that we're not living with a mix of spirit, soul. We're mix, living by the spirit with the soul in surrender and submission to our spirit. So important that we learn to live by the spirit because the Western church is a, is a, is a mix of soul and spirit, which means we're not getting the results, we're not seeing the fruit, things aren't working for us the way they, we think they should because of what we read in the Bible. But if I'm led by my soul, I'm not being led by my spirit, which is connected to the Holy Spirit. I'm being led by my opinion, my perspective, my filters, my emotions, what I think at the time, but what I'm led by the spirit, glory. Glory, and there's such a difference, isn't there, when we're led by the Spirit as according to being led by the soul. And it's, this is your immediate location right now, spiritually speaking. You are in the heavenly, seated with Christ at his right hand, like seated, like the job is finished, it's done. You've got the authority, like man, make, it, make your decrees, whatever he tells you to do, like you're seated at his right hand. Can't get any closer than that. Listen to what he says and do it. But we live from that place, not living from here. It's so important. Oh my gosh, it's just incredible. You know, to, and then we get sucked into this area. This is where I live. This is what it looks like. This is who I am, all this kind of stuff. But you know why? Because if the devil can keep us on his turf, he's got the upper hand. Like we've got the authority. But if I'm trying to do warfare in the natural, it's not going to work. It's got to be spirit. It's got to be spirit. He's a spirit being. You can't deal with him naturally. I have tried. You know, bad temper, short temper. God, I, I, you know, like before I was born again, bad temper, short temper, angry temper. And it would always kind of flare up and flare out. And I would try to stop, try to behave myself, try to be a better girl, try to be good. Impossible. If I did manage, 
It would be for a short period of time and then it would be so built up on the inside, it's like, you know, volcanic eruption. We've got to learn to live by the Spirit in submission to Holy Spirit and our soul in submission to our spirit. And then he says in verse 7, he did this, God did this, that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come, future, the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his grace, his unmerited favour in his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Just think about that. His kindness and goodness of heart towards you in Christ. And today as I was going through that, I said, Lord, I'd really love to see your kindness to me today. Let me experience your kindness today. Yeah? Because this is why he did this. The exceeding riches of his grace in the ages to come. So we are a witness now that he will be using in the ages to come. The tenses in the Bible are just crazy. And then he talks about new relationships. Verses 11 to 22 is all about them, like new relationships, the parallel between what we were before and who we are now. Our, our relationship in Christ and our relationship with us before. So let me just read verses 11 and 12. Therefore remember that at one time you were called Gentiles or heathens in the flesh, called uncircumcision by those who call themselves circumcision, which is itself a mere mark in the flesh made by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from all part in him. I can't even imagine what that would be like. Utterly estranged and outlawed from the rights of Israel as a nation. Strangers with no share in the sacred compacts or the covenants of the messianic promise. No knowledge of or right in God's agreements and God's covenants. And you had no hope, no promise, and was in the world without God. Man... That's really so sad. And he says, at that time, you were. Verses 13 to 18 is all about, but now, in Christ Jesus. So Paul's laying out this really deliberate thing. And in verses 19 to 20, he says, now you are. So you were, but now in Christ Jesus, you are. It's just awesome. So the five things about the past is we were without Christ. Think about that. Think about the people in the streets who are without Christ. Family members without Christ. I know he's everywhere and all things will be consummated in him, but there's no personal relationship. It says we were aliens, strangers. To covenant, we were aliens. And then it says we were strangers to the covenant promises, all the things we just rely on in life now. We had no hope and were without the knowledge of God or without God in the world. That's who we were. Paul says, I need you to remember this. Why do I want you to remember it? Because you need to appreciate who you are now. You need to recognise what God has given you now. You need to know who you are, the wealth of who you are, what God has given you. You need to know all of this, but also remember when you're with people who don't have what you have, mm -hmm. remember where they are at because you were there once. Yeah, yeah. Use that as a tool for evangelism. Mm -hmm. Tara, you're so good at evangelising in that hospital. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just flows out of you. But verses 13 to 18, I was trying to think of that song because when I was writing this out today, all I could think of was, but baby, look at me now. You know, and that's an old song. But baby, look at me now. Verses 13 to 18. You know, it says that, uh, but now, but now, you need to underline the now. Now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were so far away, 
through the blood of Christ have been brought near, for he himself is your peace. He has made both Jew and Gentile one body and has broken down the hostile dividing wall between us by abolishing in his own um, flesh the enmity um, caused by the law with its decrees and ordinances for which he annulled. From the two he might create in himself one new man, a new quality of humanity out of the two, making peace. And he designed to recognize, reconcile to God both Jew and Gentile, united in a single body by means of his cross, killing the mutual enmity, bringing the feud to an end. And he came and preached the glad tidings of peace to you who were far off and peace to those who are near. For it is through him that we both whether it's far off or near, now have an introduction or have an access by one spirit to the Father that we're able to approach him. Everything is new. And everything is new. So in verse 19, we are citizens of one kingdom. He says that you are no longer outsiders, but you now share citizenship with the saints. We are citizens of God's kingdom. In verse 19 again, it says, we are members of one family. We're members of his royal family. So that the whole thing, these five um, verses or five things that we're looking at, who you are now is all about one. You're citizens of one kingdom, members of one family, built on one foundation in verse 20. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. So there's one foundation. And then he says we're parts of one building. In him, the whole structure is... Oh, look, I've jumped. I've jumped. But we'll finish this anyway. We'll go back. But uh, this is... And in him, you are parts of one building in verse 21. In him, the whole structure is is joined, continues to rise into a holy temple in the Lord. One temple, one building, indwelt by one spirit. So there's one kingdom, one family, one foundation, one building, and one spirit. And that's verses 19 to 22. I just completely jumped 13 to 18, but there you go. You get excited, and I lose track, right? I just love the book of Ephesians. It just is awesome. And then the book of Colossians, oh, my gosh, they're almost like parallel in so many ways. But this is who you are. And we're, we're, this is like whatever division you feel you've got against a brother or a sister well it's just your perspective it's not right because we're citizens of one country we all belong to one family and I still say sometimes father you have the most dysfunctional family I am aware of <laughs> I thought my family was bad but hey have you looked at yours but one family one foundation one temple one spirit we are one body so what affects one person affects everybody. Whether it's good, bad or indifferent, it affects the body because the health of the cells reflect into the health of the body. That's why, you know, pray for the body of Christ because you're praying for yourself. We're all part of the body. We need each other. You know, I, 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 I know something about the Lord and then I hear somebody else say, oh, God. and I think, oh, God, I don't know you like that. Mm. Oh, and then that starts me on to think, oh, they know you like that. I want to know you like that. I've never thought about that. Can you show me what that's like? So this, as we come together, there's a wholeness and a fullness and a, and a fueling of fire and, and a hunger for the knowledge of God. And, and the beautiful thing is that when we come together as one, we're like this beautiful jewel throwing off so many different facets of light and glory and beauty and culture. And it's just like, oh, my gosh, because you can't put God God into words. You can't put him in a in a cage. He's just God of the universe. And he's he's designed that he wants to come and live in us. Like I mean crazy. Right? That he thought before the foundation of the world, I'm gonna have a chick called Suzette. And I'm just gonna go and invade her life. I'm just gonna go and live on the inside of her. I've got plans for her she knows nothing about. Right. Slab of concrete, <laughs> heart of stone. She knows nothing. But I've got all these great things. Right? That's why we need to celebrate our future. 
because he wrote it and he planned it and you are wanted you are so important to the kingdom but more than anything else you are so loved by the father you are so important to him he ordained you before the beginning of time and commissioned you His plan for you is perfect. It's fulfilling in every way. He's just wonderful. Just wonderful. But let me go back to verses 13 to 18, which is what I thought I was talking about because I got so excited in the word, I got it all wrong. But let me just show you some things. Because this is our God. Like He's given us such a, a, a brand new life. There is nothing wrong with it. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's no shortfall in any way. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect. And he withholds nothing from us. Nothing. So in verse 13 it says, um, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were so far away in the blood of Christ, you've been brought near. So all distance has been destroyed. All distance. It doesn't matter how far away we think we are from God. It doesn't matter how, you know, like, oh, my prayers are just hitting the ceiling. Nothing's getting through. We all go through stages like that. But that's not the truth. Yeah. The distance between you and God has been utterly destroyed. Thank you. There's no distance. Thank you, God. He's in you. He says in verse 14 that he, he himself is our peace and he's made Jew and Gentile one body, broken down the hostile dividing wall between us. So disunity has been dissolved. Cultural disunities have been dissolved. Not just Jew and Gentile, but the cultural disunity between Gentiles have been dissolved. He's broken down the middle wall. So any kind of division is done. If you think there is a division between you and another brother or sister in Christ, if you think there's a spirit of offence or whatever, it's there because people might have chosen that. But it is illegal because Jesus or God says, I've broken down the middle wall. There is no division. And so we, we might not agree with somebody in the body of Christ. doesn't matter. We love them. We don't have to agree, but we are to love them. But recognise that there should be no, no division because the middle wall, the wall that stands between people, has been broken down. Love can flow freely. The only thing that puts a blockage on love is our perceptions. And that means we're not in flowing with the Holy Ghost, right? In verse 15, it says, By abolishing in his own flesh the enmity caused by the law with its decrees and ordinances, which he annulled, he, that he from the two might create in himself one new man, one new quality of humanity out of the two, so making peace. So he has abolished enmity. How cool is that? He has abolished enmity. In some cases, you wouldn't know that. When, you know, I'm a Pakia to the Maoris. Pakia. That's not a nice term, actually. It just means whitey. And I, am a, I glow in the dark on that white, you know. But, but, you know, when I was in New Zealand, I'm in an intercessory prayer group of seasoned intercessors. And I'm the only Pakia. And the hatred. Because of the racism. Because of what Cook had done. We had brought the gospel. We didn't always do it well. Colonization is not. But even the Garden of Eden was colonized. Satan colonized the Garden of Eden. I, my, my ancestors are from Ireland. We were taken as prisoners and slaves so many times in Ireland, it's not funny. And I was reading through something the other day that showed the marks of being a slave in the generations. 
And I thought, oh my gosh, I ticked, ticked in the past five out of five. That's my Irish heritage. But I've got a different heritage now. I've got a kingdom heritage, right? But yeah, but but the what? And so I, I realized what's going on in the realm of the spirit. So I said, I want to ask forgiveness for what colonization has done for you. The evil of colonization. There's a lot of good in it, but a lot of evil. And I just want to ask forgiveness. Well, I tell you what, was I surrounded? And they're standing right in front of me. And I thought, I honestly thought, I am dying tonight. I honestly thought I was going home. It was like, that's when I thought, really not good to travel by yourself. <laughs> but I honestly thought, I'd be lucky to get a beating. Just, I'm not sure I'm going to get home tonight. I'm going that way, not back to the hotel. And this one lady was so angry. And she's standing right here and she's staring straight into my eyes and, and I'm trying to remain calm. <laughs> yeah, intercessors. Intercessors. But, you know, God is doing a healing in the nations. He's doing a healing in the nations. And she said to me, my, whatever he was, great, I forget how many greats, uncle was the first Maori Captain Cook murdered. But to her, it was like it had just happened. And in our culture, what's happened's happened, right? It's, in our culture, it's not that big of a deal down, down the track. But to her, it was like it's just happened. And so she's, she's staring into my soul, trying to figure out whether I'm on the level or not. And then she said, I believe you. And with that, that middle ball <laughs> came down. And so quite often we're going to find it where we least expect it because I'm walking into an intercessors meeting to do a training, right, and walking into, oh, my gosh, I didn't expect this. But there's a lot of things we don't expect. But God is healing the nations. And so we're going to be involved in the healing of the nations. We're going to be involved in the healing of land. We're going to be involved in the healing of racial differences because there's only one race, and that's the human race. Right? Seriously. That's it. We've all got our stories. But we all come from Adam. Yeah. Yeah. But God wants to use us in the healing. Yeah. And it's only when we recognise that he's pulled down every wall of division that we can actually take our place and be part of the healing mm -hmm. of the nations. Amen. Healing of the tribes. Healing of whatever's going on healing we need to be you know redemptive healers for people for situations so he's abolished the enmity and out of it all he's made one new man we are distinctive in our unity so whether we're jew or gentile you've been reconciled to god you have peace with god and you have access to god and just like that just with yeah you're in his presence like, you're always in his presence. When you just acknowledge him, you're right in the throne room. And you carry the fullness of redemption. You carry the fullness of salvation. You carry the very life of Christ on the inside. And he wants to use you. And use is such a bad word when we think about it, but really we're in his service. We are at the service of the king. We are here to do the king's bidding. Yes. And if he wants to use us, he wants to show himself in us. Yes, he wants to show himself in us. And Gwyn, when you go to Africa later this year, Tanzania, when you go to Tanzania, you will be part of what God wants to do in that nation for the healing of the nations. And Muriel, as the intercessor, you are also getting the reward for that. He has to share his reward with you because God's good like that. <laughs> you might need your mind. What's <laughs> sweet is yours and what's yours is yours. But this is the thing. Get your soul in submission to your spirit so that your spirit is allowed free access and you live by your spirit. Because when you live by your spirit, you're living from heavenly places. 
No lack, no limitations. When you live from heaven, all things are possible. All things. The minute we start to think, oh, I don't see how, maybe, whatever, you're in your soul. Stay in your spirit. Or allow your spirit to be first and foremost. He's given us such a gift. You know, when we talk about salvation, like just give your life to Jesus and you'll go to heaven. That's not salvation. That's a destination. Salvation is God loves you so much that he wants to come into your life and live his life through you. He wants to show you how to live. He's come to give you an abundant life. He wants to teach you how to live. An abundant life. And when we start living that, we're going to see a whole lot of refugees trying to get into the kingdom. You know how they sit in boats trying to get into other countries? Because they think it's going to offer a better lifestyle. We're not seeing people really radically trying to force their way into church. Not really seeing much of that, except for you churches, they line up outside for a few hours. Not yet. Not yet. The thing is, when we start to live this, people are going to look at it and say, man, I want what you've got. I'll have what she's having. I'll have that. Now, you've had people walk into your house and say, man, this just feels different. Because they can sense the peace. Or they look at you and say, how did you cope with your children? Because mine are just so rebellious. And But yours, there's something about your family. There's something about the way you handle your finances. There's something about the peace that you carry. There's something about you. There's something about your life that is attractive to other people. And they want to know what it is. But actually, you've just got to introduce them to who it is. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Who it is. This is your wealth. <laughs> this is your wealth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're not Gwyn Jones in the natural. Oh, you are in the natural. You are in the natural. Yes, you are in the natural. But you are, you are like Gwyn Jones, the son of God, member of the royal household, ambassador for Christ, you know, new creation in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, temple of the Holy Spirit, Jones. That's who you are, right? This, this, is, this is the reality. You know, so we've got to embrace this and live this. Enjoy this. Enjoy it. It is fun. It's an adventure in faith. It's awesome. I don't know about you, but I, I'm craving adventure. Like every time I say that, I think, uh oh. <laughs> but that's. I can relate. That's the flesh, right? Oh, I don't know what it is. But we want the adventure. We want that freedom, that, that just, oh, God, take us on an adventure. And then we think, oh, my gosh, what did I just pray? You know? Oh, my gosh, what did I just pray? <laughs> but it's the only way to live. It's the only way. And I think that's the apostolic in me because I get bored so easy. And I think, man, if this is all there is to life, There's got to be more. There's got to be more. Come on. And then I realised that God's saying, Suzette, I want you to come on. It's not about me coming on. I want you to come on. Come on the journey. Come on the journey. Step into the glory cloud. Come on. Have a circle around the throne a few times. Just really see what's going on. You complaining about the noise in worship? <laughs> come into the throne room. <laughs> Just enter the throne room. My gosh. It's noisy. It's loud. It's, it's just, you know, I was going to say crazy, but it's, it's good crazy. But, you know, like, we allow our soul to dictate so much. And we have.
have actually got to tell our souls, you know, soul, thank you so much for looking after me. You've done a good job. Maybe not so much a good job in other areas, but you, you've done the best you could. But now I need you to step back because I need to live by my spirit. I need to live by my spirit. So soul, I need you to take your rightful place in submission to my spirit. And body, you stop letting me know how much you want potato chips and ice cream. And you just come into submission to my soul, okay? So that I live in divine order. Divine order, spirit, soul, body. And soul, you are the conduit between the spirit and the flesh. So you had better connect with the spirit because I don't need you telling me what the flesh wants. I need you to receive from the spirit, flowing it through to the body. So I'm actually living like Christ. Oh, wow. We are the most blessed of people. We are the most blessed. We are just not who we look like at all. I was on a radio program once and the guy said, when he was in, talking to me and asking me questions, and he always felt like he was trying to set me up. You know how you feel like? You're just trying to set me up, boy. I've been around the bush a few times. I know what's going on. <laughs> and he would ask a question and I would feel the immediate response and I was aware, whew, I don't think that's the spirit because I really wanted to put him in his place. <laughs> so I would just sort of like take a breath and then I would answer it and it would be the wisdom of God, right? And he said, you should see this woman. She looks like an old grandma on the outside. They lost me right then, right? <laughs> old grandma on the outside. He said, but when I ask a question, there's this silence and then she comes back like superwoman. And I think, yeah, mate, you better believe it. <laughs> but this is who you are. You know Clark Kent, Superman, the whole thing? Stop, forget about Clark Kent. Dead and buried. Live by your spirit, because that's who God's called you to be. Live by your spirit. Find out his name for you. And ask, and, and get to be aware of the angels that he's put around you. Get to be aware of the angels he's put around you. Get to know who, who they are, how they work, how you can interact with them. I was speaking with Logan and Sharon on Friday, and they've just come back from Philippines, Fiji. Fiji. And um, they thought they were speaking at these night meetings, and they were given like five minutes, the guest speakers, five minutes, and the local pastors had all the time. And they're sitting there, and it's all, you know, it's all God works everything out. And then Logan said to Sharon, what are our angels doing? Because they were just kind of, Logan and Sharon were just sitting there most of the nights, just sitting there, um, apart from the meetings that, the other meetings that they had. And he said, what are our angels doing? So Sharon asked, and she looked up, and she saw them in the tree. <laughs> and one was swinging, you know, like from his knees on the tree on a branch, you know how kids, and the other one's playing with a yo-yo, like bored out of their tree. And we need to know how to keep our angels occupied. Because angels do not like being idle. They're here to minister to us, Hebrews 1.14. They are here to minister to the heirs of salvation. Keep them busy. Keep them busy. Don't let them wander off and play in somebody else's yard. They're yours. Learn how to work with them. Learn how to talk with them. Recognise that God has sent them. You don't worship them or anything else, but we have to learn how to cooperate because angelic ministry is increasing. You need to know how to flow with it. In Jesus' name. I have no idea how to end this, but I'm ended. Okay, it's done. <laughs>